Good afternoon, everybody, from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. I'm Josh Byerly. We'd like to welcome you to today's news conference as we take a look at the upcoming historic demonstration mission by SpaceX to the International Space Station. We are joined by an entire panel today, which includes Bill Gerstemeyer, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. We also have Mike Suffredini, the Program Manager for the International Space Station. We are also joined by Alan Lindemoyer, NASA's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program Manager, as well as Elon Musk, the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Designer for SpaceX. And finally, we have Holly Ridings, who is the NASA Flight Director, who will be on console during the upcoming flight. We'll start off with Bill. Thanks, Josh. Um, today we did the uh, flight readiness review for uh, the SpaceX Dragon flight. Um, this was uh, not a shuttle flight review um, in the sense that we didn't really look at uh, all the aspects of the launch. We really just focused really on the ISS portion of the launch. And this is very similar to what we've done in the past for uh, the automated transfer vehicle and also for the uh, Japanese transfer vehicle, the HTV. What we do in the review is we make sure that the station is ready to receive the vehicles uh, that the uh, teams are trained, that the crew on orbit is ready, that we thought about all the contingencies that could occur, and we're really ready to go, go through the demonstration mission. And, and again, I think the teams are, are very well prepared. Um, the SpaceX team gave us a nice uh, kind of introductory review of what they've done and their preparations. That was a very thorough discussion by the SpaceX team. They've done a tremendous amount of work getting ready to get to get to this point. They've done a lot of work in terms of both hardware, getting it ready to go fly, getting the software ready to go fly. I was very impressed with uh, the overall work. Um, again, I think they've made tremendous progress as a team. So they've got uh, one more long simulation to go do, or one more simulation to do, and Holly will probably talk about that some more. Um, there's still some work we need to do, some more software testing that needs to get done, some other activities. Everything looks good as we head towards the April 30th launch date, but I would caution us all that there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done. There's some things we've got to do on our side to validate some software and things after the SpaceX, te SpaceX team completes, and we've, our teams will have to go look at that data and then make sure that it's all okay. So I think there's, there's a good chance to, to make the 30th. We'll continue to work through this stuff over the next week or so. On the 23rd of April, we'll get back together again and just kind of assess where we are overall to see how things are moving forward. But again, tremendous progress by the teams. I was very impressed with the discussion between the NASA teams and the SpaceX teams. When I, when I hear the discussion back and forth, it's really one team. They're really focused on how do we deliver cargo to space station? How do we get ready for this next phase? And, and these teams have worked just phenomenally well together. So with that kind of attitude, I look forward to, uh, to good activities as we move, move towards the launch. So thank you. Mike? Well, good afternoon. Uh, we're uh, always excited when we uh, have a vehicle coming to ISS, but uh, this will be one of those historic uh, launches with the first uh, commercial vehicle coming to ISS to provide uh, supplies, uh, not only for this particular flight, which is a demonstration flight, but really for the long term. Uh, this is the beginning of a long term effort uh, to have the commercial vehicles supply the ISS, which is a critical need for the, for the program. As Bill said, uh, we had a successful uh, flight readiness review, and then uh, prior to that, the program has what we call a stage, op stage ops readiness review. And at that time, what we verify in this new world order is really safety of the vehicle uh, within a sphere around the uh, ISS. We call it the approach ellipsoid, and it's about two kilometers by four kilometers around the ISS. And the requirements we levy on the SpaceX uh, company and any of the vehicles that want to do a burn that enters them into or aims them to come into that uh, ellipsoid uh, requires that they meet our requirements. And, and all of those requir requirements are built around safety of the vehicles and safety of the crew uh, it's, uh, themselves. And so we have spent the last uh, couple of years, several months uh, with our SpaceX uh, uh, colleagues uh, working through the verifications, all of the requirements that had to be met, the testing that, uh, that, was, uh, that we dictated, but also the testing they did on their own to validate the performance of the vehicle. Um, and then uh, as this part of the process, as we get closer to launch, we're cleaning up our verifications where they complete testing, they send the reports to say this is what occurred during the test, we review the reports, we review the data, and confirm that the vehicle's ready to go. So at this stage of, of preparations, as we uh, get close to an, a potential April 30th uh, launch, 
we're in, we're in good shape. We still have some, what we refer to as non-standard open work, and, and that just means there's uh, some of the verification closures need to be completed. Uh, they're related to uh, hardware in the loop type uh, testing. It's, uh, it's where you get the hardware and the software together and make sure they, they operate the way you expect. Uh, so we have the last little bit of that testing uh, to go, and then they'll, uh, our SpaceX colleagues will submit their reports to us. Uh, based on the plan we have, and uh, and we'll review those and assume everything's fine, we'll be ready uh, for the uh, for the launch. What is unique about this, however, is you notice I didn't say we had any requirements for mission success, and that's what our SpaceX co colleagues have been working on and Bill uh, uh, referred to, since we're not responsible for the, the ascent phase or even the, the early on orbit phase. Um, this is the responsibility of our, our uh, SpaceX colleagues, and we've left it to them to define their requirements and then meet the requirements prior to launch. Uh, and it's been a learning experience, I think, for both uh, NASA and SpaceX. We've really grown together as, uh, as two organizations, and I would say not only is the logistics that this vehicle will bring, not only this flight, but in subsequent flights, important to this program, but I think the relationship between a, a company like a SpaceX and NASA in terms of our design engineers and even us program managers have learned a lot from one another, and so that's been a great benefit uh, for us uh, as a program. Uh, quickly, the uh, SpaceX will bring up this, this vehicle, even though it's a demo flight, will bring up 520 uh, one kilograms of cargo to the ISS, so we are going to utilize the, the uh, flight uh, for real hardware that, that is uh, uh, necessary for ISS. And in addition to that, and, and, um, and an important aspect, unique aspect of the SpaceX will be the return of cargo, and we have about 660 kilograms of cargo that will be returned. Uh, some of it we would like to uh, get back and, and uh, refurbish for, uh, for subsequent flights. And so, this is a very important flight, flight for us, and, and we're utilizing uh, it as such. Uh, however, each, each piece of hardware that's going up and each piece we've put on there to come home, we did do an assessment, since this is a demo flight, we did an assessment and said, if things didn't quite work out, uh, is that okay? And we, we didn't put anything on the vehicle that we didn't think that we could stand to, uh, to not get home. Um, but uh, it, it is always an advantage to us whenever we can try to get additional information, and that's what we focused on on, on this flight in the return manifest. Just real quickly, I want to talk about where we are in the uh, in space station on orbit relative to this flight and all the other work. The crew has been focusing on on research, as as we've talked about a lot over the last several uh, get-togethers, and uh, and and as we approach this period that includes the SpaceX launch and berthing, we have a number of activities going on. Uh, we have the uh, 47P launch that's scheduled next on uh, April the 20th, and it, it will dock to the ISS on the 22nd. Uh, shortly after that, um, the, uh, the crew will uh, return home. Um, Dan and Anton and Anatoly will come home on the 27th of April. And then after that, we'll uh, prepare the, the uh, uh, Don and Andre uh, will prepare for the, uh, the berthing of, of uh, the SpaceX vehicle. And prior to that time, I think Holly might touch on a little bit, we've done the prep work. The crew actually is getting additional training on orbit. Uh, but not only do they need to do that training for what's going to happen on, on uh, the 3rd of May, but they also have to do all the work they need to do to get the, the uh, other crew ready to come home and also to have the uh, docking of, of this 47 progress. And then after the SpaceX gets there, we have the next Soyuz that's gonna come up and dock, and then after that, we'll have the release and return of the, of the uh, SpaceX uh, demo vehicle. So, so you can see that while we are gonna focus on getting this new vehicle there, it is, a, it is a workhorse for us. It is intended to be a logistics vehicle that gets to station, it delivers its cargo, and, and, and then it, it departs so the next vehicle can take its slot or so that the crew then can focus on research. And, and it will begin that way with the very first flight. We're not, we're not opening up a big hole and, and having this demo take effect. It's an integrated part of an overall plan, and we intend to treat it as such. And so uh, we're looking very forward to that flight. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Al Lindemore. Okay, thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. So when the decision was made to retire the shuttle and continue our exploration program, we very much would have liked to purchase commercial services to resupply the space station. But those capabilities just simply didn't exist in the U.S. markets. 
So we decided to think like, uh, think like an investor. We wanted to become a consumer of services rather than a customer of requirements. That would be our more traditional approach. Write a requirements, go hire a prime contractor, and uh, develop the capability. But we believed that these capabilities were within the grasp of U.S. commercial industry. So five years ago, we set these objectives for the program. You could pull those up if you would. We had to learn to think like an investor. We wanted to place strategic financial investments to help stimulate the commercial space industry. Then we put some structure around those investments where we developed the program to have the companies uh, demonstrate these capabilities with the goal of achieving safe, reliable, and cost-effective services. We were looking to help lower the cost of access to space. We believed that that would, of course, help us out and also be the key to opening up new markets in low Earth orbit. And the third thing we, we said is, if we're successful in placing these investments and have solid uh, commercial partners, well, then it's important to be able to sustain that new capability, sustain the new market that's created, and NASA would become a customer for those services. And by reducing the cost, we hope that this will also be sustained by opening up new markets by this uh, lower cost access to space. Well, we came, we uh, uh, followed through on that promise in December of 2008. Uh, not only had we awarded the Space Act agreements for the development program for the new commercial services, but we also awarded the resupply contracts for the space station. So we certainly uh, followed through our promise to become a very uh, interested customer. Uh, next chart. So this is a summary of the new capabilities we're about to see demonstrated with SpaceX. Uh, we did uh, sign the agreement with SpaceX in August of 2006. We've monitored SpaceX's performance over the years through a series of pre-negotiated milestones. And this is also a difference that, uh, from our traditional approach of, of uh, regular contracting. In this case, we only made payments after the milestone was achieved. It was up to SpaceX to uh, provide the necessary funding and resources necessary to meet each one of these incremental milestones, and then when they were successively made, we, we made our incremental payments. To date, we've uh, paid 37 out of a total of 40 for $381 million of investment out of a possible $396 million total on the agreement. All the milestones are completed except for the last three, this upcoming uh, demonstration flight. This is the second demonstration under our Space Act agreement. Uh, the first demonstration fight was completed uh, for our program in December of 2010, a very successful first flight of the uh, Dragon spacecraft on the Falcon 9, uh, an orbital demonstration and return. Next chart, please. Uh, in addition, we also have a commercial partnership with Orbital Sciences. This is a very similar uh, Space Act agreement arrangement uh, with Orbital. They, they uh, started a year and a half later than our agreement with, with uh, SpaceX, and they're also making very good progress. We'll see Orbital planning to fly later this year. They'll be starting with uh, a, a maiden flight of their new launch vehicle, the Antares launch vehicle. This will be launched out of the uh, brand new launch pad at Wallops Island, Virginia, off the eastern shore of Virginia. So we're looking for that later in the year. Uh, they have five milestones left, the completion of the uh, first stage assembly, the maiden test flight. Um, then they will be complete the vehicle for the uh, demonstration to the International Space Station. And that agreement will uh, finish up with the flight to the station uh, uh, later in the year as well. Next chart. So this is a history of the performance of the milestones that we established in the agreement. Up top, you'll see uh, SpaceX agreement starting in 06. Uh, it started with the series of design reviews, system requirements reviews, preliminary design reviews, moving into a critical design phase. 
Then SpaceX moved on to the test and production phase. We saw the maiden test flight in 2010. And then last year, we requested and received funding for additional funding for our program to help improve the chances of mission success for our program. So we worked together, SpaceX and I, and we came up with uh, a series of additional milestones to add additional testing to help improve the chance of mission success. This was primarily system level testing. Last year, SpaceX completed system level thermal vacuum tests, electromagnetic interference tests, acoustic testing, and uh, all that uh, was a, a, a very high importance to us. There was a lot of learning going on, and I think it is going to be very, very valuable uh, to us. So that was kind of completed last year. And now we're moving into the uh, finishing up our demonstration phase with the uh, d a demonstration to the station. So let's talk about the objectives of this flight. We, we call it C2, that stands for COTS2. It's the COTS demonstration two flight. Uh, this flight originally was to be a flyby to the station. That is, it was to uh, do a rendezvous with the space station, and then it is to do a, uh, a flyby beneath the station, no closer than two and a half kilometers, or about a mile, a mile and a half. And during this period, it is going to execute prerequisite maneuvers that are required before we give the final approval for the final approach and berthing with the space station. These are the same type demonstration objectives that were accomplished with other visiting vehicles to the station, the ATV and the HTV, all demonstrated before the final approach that they had the ability to do GPS navigation relative navigation, absolute navigation, the ability to do abort maneuvers, the ability to uh, free drift and hold for a while. These, these are, are the requirements that must be achieved before uh, the go is given to do the final approach. Uh, that would be a very successful mission under the C2 program, and then it would re-enter uh, and be recovered. Uh, SpaceX approached us last year and said uh, they would like to attempt to also complete the berthing, the final approach and berthing to the demonstration on the upcoming flight. So after reviewing the proposal and doing the required safety analysis to be assured that the vehicle and the systems are ready to go, we agreed to give SpaceX that opportunity for uh, actual completing the berthing demonstration on this flight. That will also include demonstrating the LIDAR sensors. Those are the radars and the, and the rendezvous sensors that gives you the range and the range rate information as you approach the station. They'll be doing some close-in retreat demonstrations, hold demonstrations, and finally the vehicle will be captured by the robotic arm and then berthed to the Earth-facing side of the forward node on the station. After about 18 days of uh, demonstrating the car uh, transfer of cargo to and from the station, we'll see the uh, Dragon unberth from the station and then, and then return, return home. Uh, we call this mission C2+. Plus. It's the C2 mission plus the additional objectives of completing this, the C3 objectives on this flight. So let's see, if you run the video now, I guess uh, we'll take a look at what we can expect to see. Targeting now for the end of the month, we'll see the Falcon 9 lift off from a beautiful day at the Cape. About three minutes later, we'll see the stage separation between the first and upper stages on the Falcon 9. Then about 10 minutes into flight, it'll be in orbit. The Dragon and its trunk will separate from the upper stage. About a minute later, the solar arrays will be deployed. And then it'll begin its phasing maneuvers to the space station. It takes about a day to get to the proper phasing and rendezvous with the station. The second day will be used to complete the demonstration maneuvers I talked about. And if all goes well, SpaceX will re-rendezvous with the station. And on the third day, we'll see the uh, final approach. And the vehicle will be captured by the arm and berth. This operation takes about eight hours by the time you get in 
to the final approach to the actual uh, berthing with the station. After a few weeks on orbit, it'll be unberthed. And then it'll be preparing for uh, a deorbit burn and reentry about two to four orbits later. We'll see the Dragon reenter, parachute deploy, and splash down off the coast of California. That would be a very good day. <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody. We're certainly very excited to be here. This has been a great partnership between NASA and SpaceX. I want to thank my team. Uh, Mike Korkachuk, project executive, has been with us uh, since the beginning, and uh, his assistant, uh, Warren, who's helped make available the uh, vast resources at, at NASA to help SpaceX. So thank you. It's been a great partnership. We're really excited and looking forward to the launch. Elon? All right. All right, well, uh, I'd just like to start off by um, saying thank you to, to NASA for giving us this opportunity. Um, as you may have heard me say before, SpaceX wouldn't have been able to get started without the amazing uh, work that NASA had done in the past, and we wouldn't have gotten this far without the help of NASA. So I'd like to be real clear in uh, expressing my appreciation for that. Um, and I'd also like to express a note of appreciation to, to the American public who are ultimately funding funding this and and just want people to know that uh, we've really done everything we can to, to make sure that this mission is going to go well. Um, it's been a huge amount of hard work by the SpaceX team um, in partnership with NASA. And um, I think we've got a pretty good shot, but uh, it, it is worth emphasizing that there's that is, there's a lot that can go, uh, well, a lot that can go wrong in a mission like this because you've got to have the success of the rocket and then you've got to have the success of the, the spacecraft. Now, we have, we've launched the rocket twice before and we've launched the spacecraft once, um, but they're still, they're still relatively new. Um, and then uh, there's the, the whole proximity operations uh, and berthing system, uh, which is going to be tested for the first time in space. And, um, and so there's, there's, um, there's, and there's, no, there's no space station on the ground. So our work to date has been done with, done by a simulation and by approximating uh, the circumstances that it would find in, in orbit and, and approaching the space station. So um, I, I think that's, that's just important to appreciate that there's, this, is, this is pretty tricky. Um, and I think also for, 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 for the public out there, they, they may not realize that the, you know, the space, space station is zooming around the Earth uh, every 90 minutes, um, and it's it's going at sort of 17,000 miles an hour, and so you've got to launch up, then you've got to rendezvous and be tracking the space station to within inches, really. Um, and this is a you know something that's going 12 times faster than a bullet from an assault rifle, so it's 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 hard, um, and uh, but but I, I think I think we've got a pretty good chance. But but there's like I said, I want to emphasize this. Um, that this is, as, as has been said um, by um, other people in the panel, that this is a, that this is a test flight. So um, uh, if, 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 if we don't succeed in berthing on this mission, um, then we've got a couple of more missions later this year that uh, and I think we'll succeed on, on one of those. Um, and uh, yeah, so and I, th I think we've got some videos of the preparation that we can show. There we have the rocket uh, in the hangar at Cape Canaveral. Dragon spacecraft. Now, one of the things that's worth noting about Dragon is that we've tried to design something that is um, very similar between cargo transport and um, and uh, astronaut transport. Um, so it's uh, we expect there to be relatively few differences between the two. There's uh, Dragon um, mounted on. Falcon 9.
Here we're doing a, a wet dress rehearsal, which means we load the uh, liquid oxygen and uh, kerosene, the fuel of the rocket, and uh, just make, make sure everything's OK. And coming up soon, we'll have um, the static fire, where we'll uh, light the engines um, and uh, shake things up a little, help, but keep the rocket held down, and, uh, and then see if everything's OK before. And, and we'll spend several days analyzing that information. And if, that, if that's looking good, then we'll, uh, it'll be um, OK to, to launch the rocket in, in theory. So um, do we have another video? Uh, pardon me? Oh, Cuts Milestones. So we've got one more video to show. They're just elements of the, the rocket and spacecraft being tested. And I think it's, it is worth uh, emphasizing that the, the, the Falcon 9 has flown twice before, and Dragon has flown once. Um, so I think a lot of people in the public may not be aware of that. Um, so the, the thing that's really being tested on this flight, um, hopefully, is, the, um, is the, the, the proximity operations and birthing system. So, and and there, there are other things as well, like the solar panels and, and a few other things. But, but it's worth noting the rocket has flown twice, and the spacecraft has, has flown once. Um, all right, well, with that. All right. Well, good morning, actually, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Holly Ridings, and I'm the lead NASA flight director uh, for the SpaceX uh, Dragon demo mission. Um, I'd like to tell you guys today that the operations teams have been working um, extremely hard for multiple years, uh, really preparing uh, uh, for the launch and, and leading up to uh, uh, this day so that we could come and explain to you um, exactly what we've, we've built uh, together. Uh, the first part, of course, is uh, when you incorporate a, a new team, a new partner, in this case uh, SpaceX, our first commercial partner, um, into the space station, there's a lot of technical things you do, uh, the nuts and bolts, make sure that we can um, talk back and forth between the two control teams, uh, the control team in Hawthorne in California at the SpaceX facility, and of course um, our team here in Houston. Uh, commanding back and forth uh, telemetry, back and forth, and uh, as well as information that can pass all the way from uh, their facility in, in Hawthorne up to the space station. Uh, so we put that infrastructure in place to incorporate them as a, a new partner. Uh, we move on from there really to build the, the framework of how we're going to fly. Uh, this takes multiple years really for uh, their team to learn about the space station, for us to learn about the Dragon. Uh, it's really a, a partnership. They are, are certainly the experts in the Dragon, we're the experts in the space station, and we treat it as one team. It's two dynamic vehicles uh, flying in space together, and it's extremely important that you communicate um, and understand each uh, team's roles and responsibilities. As was alluded to earlier, our role here in Houston is really the safety of uh, the crew on board the space station, the space station itself, and then the SpaceX Dragon team is responsible for the mission success. And we've built a, a framework working together where we should be able to get both of those items uh, successfully accomplished. Uh, we write uh, documentation, uh, procedures, flight rules, the things you're familiar with, uh, with the other vehicles that NASA has flown in space. And we make sure that uh, the teams are trained to use all of that information. Uh, so we practice uh, using our simulation capability, uh, learning how that process is going to work, uh, coming up with failure scenarios and talking through how we're going to react and, and recover. Uh, from those, and again, as, as was alluded to earlier, we've performed a series of those for all the different phases of the flight. Uh, the last simulation, just the final uh, clean run for the, the, the polish before we go and, and fly here shortly uh, will actually be next week, and so we're really looking forward uh, uh, to doing uh, this run one last time on, on the ground before, before we get on orbit. 
Uh, the other big piece of our operations team, of course, is our space station crew, uh, since they will be performing uh, the, the grapple of the Dragon vehicle, uh, the berthing to the space station. And so uh, that team, our, our crew team, uh, has been working hard to prepare uh, for this mission as well. Uh, the time frame that we're uh, discussing launching in uh, is one in which we've got uh, two crew members available uh, to perform the Dragon operations. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, communicating with uh, them, uh, Don Pedret and Andre Kuypers, uh, making sure that uh, they understand uh, exactly what will be expected of them. They, of course, were trained on the ground, uh, but they have been on orbit for a while while we've continued to work down here and learn new things. And so we spend a lot of time uh, communicating all of that information uh, to make sure, really, as the third piece of our operations team, they're ready to go for us. Uh, so now we're going to kind of walk through the, the mission uh, that we've put together. So if I could have the first still, please. You can see the different uh, phases of the, the flight. So we've got our launch, um, followed by the, the phasing, where the Dragon's still uh, far away from the space station. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we'll come up and do a, a, a fly under of the space station all the way around. We've got some demonstration maneuvers, uh, followed by all of the new activities in, in the rendezvous and proximity operations. Uh, the berthing, finally the departure, re-entry, and recovery. And I've got some graphics in a minute, but before we leave this slide, in terms of roles and responsibilities, you know, really the launch and the, the phasing piece um, is, again, SpaceX uh, responsibility until they get close to the space station. Uh, that operations team is uh, taking care of, of the Dragon and, and designed all of that um, independently. Uh, we have understanding of exactly how that will go, uh, but certainly that's their responsibility. When we come up close to the space station, uh, then the interaction with the NASA team uh, begins, and uh, we've got some gates and some uh, process in place uh, where we make sure uh, that the safety of that space station, our space station, is protected. And again, uh, once the uh, Dragon has left after departure, the SpaceX team uh, takes over again and works uh, with uh, the FAA uh, colleagues and brings the Dragon home and, and performs the recovery. Uh, again, certainly that has NASA cargo, so we're interested in it. But from an operations sense, uh, the Dragon team performs that uh, function in terms of the, the departure and the recovery. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that I mentioned uh, was the demonstration objectives. Uh, these were touched on a little bit earlier. Uh, we do have some demonstrations uh, to, to really talk about the abort capability. That's one of our primary um, sort of pieces of our safety infrastructures, the capability to always safely perform uh, an abort uh, where if there was an issue, the Dragon could fly away from the space station uh, to prevent uh, having any type of uh, collision. And so that's a very important aspect of our safety framework. Uh, different pieces of navigation. As you get closer to the space station, you have to be able to navigate more accurately. And so we make sure that all of those pieces work correctly. Um, communication, of course, to dynamic vehicles in space uh, need to be able to talk to each other. And then just the general controllability in terms of uh, the, the guidance and navigation, you know, how the engines work, those type of, of activities. This has all been tested extensively by the SpaceX team on the ground. Um, had NASA folks as well involved in the, in the verification. But these are really the very important uh, critical pieces that we want to validate on orbit, uh, look at that capability before we use it in a safety critical situation. So it's really a building block approach uh, where we execute a demonstration objective is what we call it. So a piece of functionality of the spacecraft, make sure it works, and then later in the mission we will need that capability. Let's see, next page. So here's our mission profile. Um, this is obviously a two-dimensional representation of, of two dynamic vehicles moving very quickly in space, as Elon alluded to. Uh, but if you look at the red arrow down in the bottom right-hand corner and, and think about uh, the, the dragon moving in that direction over time, uh, you can see down in the far right-hand corner, that's really the, the phasing um, uh, time frame. It's uh, not to scale, so that time frame could be, you know, a day or two or three, depending on exactly um, how long the Dragon's going to take to phase to the space station. Um, so that capability, uh, it, again, is the, the function of the, the Dragon control team. Uh, so the 
the dragon will, will come up, finish its phasing, and uh, where the, the red arrow is kind of pointing at the green line, uh, that's about 10 kilometers underneath the space station, and it'll perform a, a, what we call a burn, so turn on its engines, maneuver the spacecraft, and head up that green line towards the space station, uh, ready to perform a, a fly-under of the space station at two and a half kilometers. And so that fly-under is very important to us because it's the first time the Dragon and the space station will communicate with each other, um, an absolute requirement for proximity operations. It's the first time that uh, the crew on board the ISS will send a command uh, to Dragon and get response. This is just a test command, uh, so it's a, a light on the Dragon, but it's leading towards uh, the crew potentially needing to see to send uh, more invasive commands, uh, such as a hold or retreat or even an abort later, and command the Dragon when it's at the capture point. Uh, we're also gathering navigation data. So uh, the way the two vehicles navigate together uh, is a relative where you get pieces of information from both vehicles and you um, do a calculation and then they know exactly where they are in space relative to each other. And so we're gathering information to make sure that navigation system works. Uh, so we're flying to the space station, gather all that information. The Dragon's going to head back down uh, to about 10 kilometers below and then uh, do a, a big lap around the space station called the, the fly around where it comes up the left-hand side of that graphic. Uh, it's phased fairly far out in front of the space station by then, uh, greater than 200 kilometers. And so it'll perform, a, again, a burn, another turn on the engines and, and move the spacecraft um, headed up and over the space station, come across the, the top of the space station, and then down uh, the backside uh, relative to the graphic. Again, uh, fairly far out from the space station beyond 200 kilometers. Um, so that entire process uh, should take just about uh, a full day on the order of 22 to 24 hours to complete. Let's see. Next slide, please. Uh, so now we're kind of back where we started at our red arrow, um, uh, roughly again that day later, and we're headed again back up to uh, two and a half kilometers below the space station. Uh, remember that was the, the distance that we did the fly under the day before. Um, you can see the green dot, that's where we cross into what we call integrated operations. And so I mentioned earlier uh, sort of the responsibilities of the different team members. Our responsibility in Houston being the safety of uh, the space station and the crew on board the space station. And so when we're inside of integrated operations, uh, which is in close proximity to the space station, the team here in Houston um, has authority over the mission. Of course, again, we're working as a team and in partnership and communicating with the Dragon team. Uh, but we do have the final authority uh, so that we can keep that safety at the very top of the priority list. We've come up to uh, two and a half kilometers inside of the integrated operations, and now we're going to head up uh, to 1.4 kilometer. The little dots, the little red dots, again, represent um, burns, or uh, again, a time where a dragon will fire its engines and, and adjust its height relative to the space station, so it's headed up closer to the space station. Uh, so now we're flying under at 1.4 kilometers. Um, again, uh, next red dot, this is our uh, approach initiation. So uh, this is the burn that will take uh, the Dragon um, on an intercept trajectory with uh, a position directly below the space station. We call it the R bar, so it's the radius of this between the space station and the Earth. If you drew a line from the center of the space station to the center of the Earth, and uh, 350 meters below the space station, you put a little dragon, that's where it's headed. Um, so it's going to uh, end up on uh, in that position, and uh, eventually we'll get to 350, uh, move another 100 meters, and actually pause automatically at the 250 meter hold point. Next page. <clears throat> So now we're up again on the R bar. Um, at 250 meters, the Dragon is holding, and we've got uh, some more of our demonstration objectives that we need to complete. Uh, these involve the crew uh, with some of the commanding. So you can see uh, the green uh, Dragon represented on the slide uh, will approach from 250, so it starts moving towards the space station. The crew will then command a retreat, and so it will turn and head back towards that 250 meter hold point. 
Um, the graphic has all of the dragon uh, pictures uh, spread out on the left so you can see the up and back, but they actually all will happen um, on that R bar line just forwards and backwards. Uh, it's just hard to represent on the slide. Uh, so now we've uh, gone to the uh, done, command of the retreat. We're headed back to 250. Uh, then the Dragon team and Hawthorne will send the Dragon again towards the space station. The crew will tell the Dragon to hold. That'll be at about 220 meters. And so that will be the last of our go-no-go no go, uh, uh, objectives in terms of the demonstration objectives. Um, we do have go-no-go no go criteria, and that's our, our uh, terminology that we use in our flight rules. We're here um, in Mission Control Houston and uh, with Mission Control uh, in Hawthorne at, at SpaceX. We take a poll and make sure that uh, all of the systems on board the ISS, all the systems on board the Dragon, um, any type of uh, failure detection, you know, the robotic arm, the cameras, basically everything you need in order to do that next step of the mission is in the configuration you expected. And then after you've had that communication between the two teams and everything is in the proper configuration, then the go is allowing the Dragon to proceed and continue with the next step of the mission. So when we use go, no go terminology, that's exactly what we're talking about. So at this point, we're 220 meters below the space station. Uh, we've completed all of our demonstrations. Uh, again, the uh, controllability, the navigation, the abort, um, we have taken the poll and made sure um, that uh, we've got all of the functionality we need and we're headed on up uh, towards uh, the space station again. We're going to cross um, into what's called the keep out sphere. So it's a 200 meter uh, circle around the, the space station, which we kind of use as a line of demarcation uh, for us to know that we need all of that functionality checked out uh, before we uh, head past that point. We're going to head all the way to 30 meters. Oops. If I could have the slide back, please, it might be easier. Thank you. So we're going to head all the way to 30 meters. And uh, the Dragon, again, will automatically stop at 30 meters. Uh, we're going to perform another one of those go, no go, so a poll to make sure we have all the functionality. Um, at this point, uh, the crew is, is heavily involved with, with us. They've been uh, monitoring uh, the Dragon, certainly throughout those demonstration objectives where they were sending several commands, and also as uh, the Dragon headed towards the space station uh, with the capability, if necessary, uh, to go ahead and take action although the Dragon vehicle itself is designed uh, by the SpaceX team to really be very automated and to take care of itself. The crew is really there kind of as a, a safety net, um, certainly with the, the first flight of, of the demonstration uh, uh, capability. We, we really would like uh, to make sure we've got all of the crew involved as well as the vehicle itself. So we're at 30 meters, we've taken our pole. Uh, now we're gonna head up to the 10 meter point. You may also hear this referred to as uh, the capture point. The Dragon will hold again automatically 10 meters from the space station. Um, another pole to make sure we've got all of the uh, technical capability required. And then we give a final go for capture. Uh, we tell the crew that uh, we are ready uh, for that capture, and then they really take over from that point. Uh, they have a command to inhibit uh, the thrusters on the space station, so those uh, will not fire. Uh, they'll take the Dragon uh, to what we call free drift, so again, where the thrusters do not fire, and then they will uh, drive the robotic arm, the SSRMS, um, out and capture the Dragon. Obviously, you don't want thrusters on either spacecraft uh, firing uh, when you've got your robotic arm uh, connecting the two until it's had an opportunity to, to rigidize otherwise you might harm it. So um, that process uh, will be uh, taken care of by the crew. Now we've captured uh, the Dragon successfully. Uh, the next couple steps, um, we are, are headed towards doing a, a berthing uh, of the Dragon. Uh, we do some system configuration uh, to make sure it's ready to be berthed. Uh, We'll make sure that uh, the uh, common berthing mechanism, the passive side that's on the, the Dragon, uh, is, is clean of any type of debris. And then uh, we'll head on in uh, robotically with the crew uh, flying the robotic arm to berth the Dragon to uh, the node to nadir position, again, the Earth-facing uh, position. All of that activity. Uh, uh, from uh, coming up at the two and a half kilometers all the way up the R bar takes place in one day. It's a fairly long day. It's about seven and a half hours uh, for that rendezvous and, and proximity operation. 
Um, the next morning, we'll get up and open the hatch for the first time and uh, perform the very first cargo transfer. Uh, we're going to perform roughly 25 hours of cargo transfer, uh, both unpacking and then packing the Dragon uh, while it is on orbit. And then several weeks later, uh, we'll get the Dragon uh, ready to come on home. If I could have the next slide. And so here's our reentry and recovery. Uh, in terms of space station operations, we take the robotic arm and uh, unberth the Dragon uh, from Node 2 Nader, unberth it from the CBM. Uh, we'll hold it out on the end of the robotic arm, make sure it's got all of its navigation capability up and running, and then we release uh, the Dragon. It performs a series of uh, burns, again, maneuvers. Uh, there are three of them. Uh, so one, uh, you can see uh, where the green dragon is, uh, a second one uh, at kind of the end of that half circle, and then a third one at the end of the second half circle. So a series of three, we call them departure burns, and then the dragon uh, will head away from the space station. We check that it is um, on a safe trajectory uh, away from the space station. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the operations team in Hawthorne uh, then uh, is in control again, of course, of the, the Dragon uh, in terms of outside of integrated operations. Uh, and so they will make sure that it's ready to uh, deorbit uh, and come on home, splash down in the Pacific, and then they've got their recovery operations uh, that they are going to uh, run out to bring the Dragon on in uh, into Long Beach.